Okay, we're on page 81. Page 81. The rich fool. Now, when you think about being rich, you think about Bill Gates, Donald Trump, and people like that. But if you travel the world much, you'll find out we're rich here in America. And we'll make some points about that a little later. The theme of this parable, that of which life is to consist. What is life all about? Why are you here? Why am I here? See, the average person out in the world ought to open up his eyes and say, what's this all about? How come I was born? Am I born just to get an education, get a job, raise a family, retire, rock on my porch for a little while and die? Is that what it's all about? See, we've got to realize what this life's all about. The main lesson, one who's not rich toward God will be lost. I've told this congregation several times, if you're not rich towards God, you'll be lost. I usually start it this way, you've got to be rich to be saved, but rich toward God, not rich in material goods. All right, some of the best lessons taught by our Lord was when he is interrupted. Now, if you'll read the first part of Luke 12, he is warning the disciples and the crowd about the leaven of the Pharisees, which he says is hypocrisy. Now, that's why he said in Matthew 5, 20, except your righteousness exceed their righteousness, You'll not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Yours has got to be genuine, not put on. Then he told them about fear. He says, don't fear people that can kill you. Fear the one that can take your life and your soul and place it in hell because of the way you've lived. That's the one you need to learn to fear. Then he talked about confession. He is talking about, unless you confess me, I'll not confess you before the angels of heaven. And if you deny me, I'll deny you before the angels of heaven. And then he got up on the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Now, you would think if the master teacher got off on the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, you'd want to listen to that. Right in the middle of all this teaching, one says, Master, Master, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. Now the Lord's interrupted. And during this interruption, He's going to teach an awesome lesson for you, for me, for the world. So that's where we are. Covetousness is an inordinate desire for things, and you put them above even the spiritual. So that's the deal. Here's a man that's putting his desire for his part of the inheritance, and he might have been totally right. His brother might have been trying to rip him off. But he put that above what he could learn spiritually at the feet of the master. Now you think about that. You've probably heard a lot of good Bible teachers and preachers in your lifetime, but wouldn't you love to have heard Jesus Christ teach? Well, this man had that chance. And he interrupted it. Wanting 
his part of the inheritance. So look at major point number one, Luke 12, 13. And one of the company said unto him, Master, speak to my brother that he divide the inheritance with me. Well, Jesus Christ was not involved in these kind of matters. Life's not always fair. And there will be those that will rip you off, rip me off. And that may not be settled in this life. But it will be settled in the life to come. But Christianity settles that. If I believe the principles of Christianity, can I rip you off? No. Can you rip me off? Uh-uh. See, if everybody bought into the principles of Christianity, nobody would be ripped off. So, when you understand the laws, the law under which they lived, according to Deuteronomy 21, 17, the elder brother got twice as much. So I don't know what the deal is here. In asking Jesus, he seemed to indicate that Jesus knew the law, and of course he did. He was more concerned about the material things than he was the spiritual things. Major point number two. And he said unto him, Man, who made me a judge or a divider over you? The Lord did not come here to settle every little petty difference I might have with Mike or, or with Terry or anybody else. He didn't come to do that. He came to die for you and me so that we could have life and that eternal. How many parents have gained X number of dollars and material things only to die and see their children fight over those things and become better enemies? I know a family like that now. That's so sad to be in that situation. In Luke 12, 20, but God said unto him, the man who thought he had it made in this parable, thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be which thou hast provided? And then verse 21 says, so is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. You've got to be rich toward God. Major point number three. And he said unto them, Take heed and beware of covetousness, for a man's life consisteth not in the abundance of the things which he possesseth. Man alive, you just think about what we possess here in America. We're talking about the rich fool. And as I said earlier, we're rich. Do you know that 829,000 people a year die from drinking bad water? Nearly a million people. Do you realize that 25,000 people a day die from starvation? Do you realize that makes 9,125,000 a year dying from starvation? And how many times have you and I come in from working out in the yard or whatever and said, whew, man, I'm starving to death. We don't know what hunger is. Every one of you have plenty of food in your pantry in your freezer, in your refrigerator. You don't have to worry about which child you're going to let starve to death today because you don't have enough to feed the whole family. There's people that had to make those decisions. Man, you're rich. I'm rich. We've got to make sure we don't become a rich fool. In Matthew 4, 4, and he answered and said, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, 
but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. There's the purpose of life. Even your necessities, bread, water, you don't live by those things alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of the Lord. Job said, Naked came out of my mother's womb, and naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord hath taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Paul said to Timothy, For well, we brought nothing into this world, and it is certain we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be there with content. As I get older, I realize I don't need much. When I was younger, I thought I did. If I've got food, water, a roof over my head, a good warm bed, love for my family, love from God, love from you, that's all I need for the most part. I'll say, Kay, where you want to eat out today? Nowhere, Wesley. We got leftovers in the refrigerator, and we need to eat those and not throw them out. You're right. We'll eat those. Do you realize America throws away enough food to feed those that are starving to death? We do. Man, we're rich. We just can't wind up being the rich fool. Now, I want you to look at point five, Ephesians 4, 28, and I want you to think, have I ever reasoned this way? And point five, let him that stole steal no more, but rather let him labor, working with his hands the things which is good. Now, why? That he may have to give to him that needeth. You ever been unemployed and thought, man, I need a job? Why? I got to feed my family and I need to give to people that are in need. I need to help others. God wants you to have that attitude. He wants me to have that attitude. In Matthew 6 19 through 21, lay up for yourselves treasures of Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Where is your treasure? Where is mine? When we've got people that don't care whether they come to service or not, but they've got to make it to work. Where's their heart? Where's their treasure? See, we've got to look at ourselves. Now, true character uh, consists of, uh, our uh, uh, life should consist of true character. True riches, that is, of the soul. True religion, New Testament Christianity, that will make a man free. A true family, physical and spiritual, and eventually going home to be with God. It's what this life's all about. Major point number four. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully. It's not wrong to be rich, and it's not sinful to be poor. Solomon said this in Proverbs 38 and 9, Remove far from me vanity and lies. Give me neither poverty nor riches. Feed me with food convenient for me, lest I be full, uh, full and deny thee. And say, who is the Lord? Or lest I be poor and steal, and take the name of my God in vain. What's wrong with America is we've got too much. And sometimes we forget from whence it came. We need to trust in God 
And we don't want to have too little lest we have to steal for a meal and then try to blame it on God. Why am I having it this bad? Where's God in all of this? You see, you don't want to do that. In Psalm 49, 16 and 17, Be not thou afraid when one is made rich, when the glory of his house is increased. Now watch this. For when he dieth, he shall carry nothing away. His glory shall not descend after him. When a rich man dies, he doesn't take it with him. Whatever you accumulate in this life, you're not going to take it with you. I'm not going to take it with me. Now, I believe it's the proverb writer, and I should have looked this up, that says a wise man layeth up even for his grandchildren. See, there's nothing wrong with saving for retirement and saving for your wife and your grandchildren. But don't forget those who are in need while doing that. Who's going to feed them, take care of them? Major point number five, and he thought. Look at all the personal pronouns. And he thought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. Man, his ground has brought forth plentifully, and he doesn't even have a place to store all of his crops, all of his fruits. What's he going to do? This is a major problem for him. The problem is he left God out of the solution. He left his fellow man out of the solution. Where is the concept, oh man, God's blessed me. I'm going to have to do something with this extra crops I've got. I know several families that are about to starve to death. I'm going to share with them. And I'll still have plenty. No. He didn't do that. He didn't have that attitude. Notice he thought within himself. You ever reason within yourself or talk to yourself? I used to talk to myself a lot. After I married Kay, I quit it because I was afraid she'd think I was stupid. Well, she found out I was stupid and I still didn't talk to myself. Anyway, you know, I used to go around the house all the time. Wesley, what about this? Quoting scriptures. I'd go through the house preaching. Well, Elba was used to it. She'd seen it for 48 years. But if I did that with Kay, she probably thought, that boy needs help. He needs a lot of help. Now notice, he thought within himself and he forgot that God knew his thoughts. His attitude was my fruit, my barns, my grain. In verses 17 and 18, he uses the word I six times and the word my five times. He forgot what proverb, I mean, what Psalms 50, 10 through 12 says, For every beast of the forest is mine, and the cattle upon a thousand hills. I know all the fowls of the mountains, and the wild beasts of the field are mine. If I was hungry, I would not tell thee, for the world is mine, and the fullness thereof. Whatever you have, has simply been loaned to you by God. When I trade cars, I've told the congregation this here before. I look at that car, and I say, God, thank you for loaning that to me, and thank you that I didn't hurt anybody with it. 
And thank you I didn't get hurt in it. I tell you, we owe God so much if we'll just think about it. Major point number six. And he said, this will I do. I will pull down my barns and build greater and there will I bestow my fruits and my goods. Notice, no plans for God or his people or people in it. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Now, I got to point out a little later, I think, but I'm going to make it here. Let's suppose that you and I are out riding four-wheelers or on the back of a horse. We're up on a hill. And we look down in the valley. And we see this guy's farm. Man, look at that. Look at all those crops. And he's tearing down barns and building bigger ones. If I've ever seen a success in life, he's it. That wasn't God's view of him. God's view of him, if I've ever seen a failure in life, he's it. How do we judge success in this life? We look around and we think, my, look at the car he drives. Look at the home he lives in. Look at the job he's got. Man, you're talking about a success. I'd love for my daughter to marry somebody just like that. No, you want your daughter, your son, to marry a faithful child of God. That's going to help you go to heaven. That's what you want. All right, questions or comments? Yes. I'm confident that's hard for us because we've never had the hunger and thirst for food. That's right. That's right. And so I think that's what's hard for us. We've never been there. And it's hard for us to realize the flip side of it. When Jesus said, you hunger and thirst after righteousness, he's talking about hunger and thirst, not just simply have a desire. That's exactly right. David? That's right. Yeah. So I just think that when we will, that we have an attitude that we're not doing it anyway, but it is the only thing that we can do. That's exactly right. Sure is. Kay and I was over at, uh, what's the name of that restaurant in Bristol, Kay? Cooter Brown's. <laughs> Have I got it right? And. We were eating there, and I told the waitress, will you bring my bill, please? She said, it's been paid for. I said, paid for? Who paid for it? She said, he wanted me to give you this note. Now, I've got it in my billfold, except the writing has disappeared from it, from carrying it around. And it said something like this. That you might know that baptism is not for the remission of sins, I decided to pay for your meal. 
Well, you got that wrong. I appreciate it. But I'd have loved to have known who did it that I might have had the opportunity to sit down and talk to him. I'd have bought him a meal to get to talk to him. And sure. <laughs> Yeah, I think I probably have already talked to him. So I jumped up and looked around, and I went inside to go to the restroom. Boy, I was looking at everybody. I didn't recognize anyone. But I believe it was a preacher from the Bristol area with whom, like Howard says, we had already done some teaching. But you're all right. Now, this man... Oh, he's got so many good traits. He's not slothful. He's a good businessman, a good farmer. He's just not a good listener when it comes to what life's all about. He's missed what life is all about. The world would deem this man a tremendous success. Major point number seven in Luke 12, 19. And I will say to my soul, soul, Thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. I have it made. Man, I can eat, drink, and be merry. Well, he left God out of his plans, and God's got a message for him. You and I have no promise of tomorrow, and we got to make sure that we live for God today. You know, to live the Christian life, you only have to live one day at a time. The only day I got to be faithful to God is today. Because I have no promise of tomorrow, and when tomorrow comes, all I got to do is be faithful to Him tomorrow. One day at a time. And make sure I put God first. Our occupation really is Christianity. And Ephesians 4, 1 through 3 says that. So if my occupation is Christianity, if I'm a farmer, then that's something I do to make a living a little bit here on the face of this earth, electrician or whatever. But see, if my occupation is Christianity and I'm playing baseball and the umpire makes a bad call, because of my occupation, I can't cuss him out. Christianity won't let me do it. And if I'm a businessman, because of my occupation, Christianity, I can't rip you off. I got to live within the boundaries of Christianity. Boy, that makes Christianity so beautiful. Major point number eight, Luke 12, 20. But God said unto him, Thou fool! This night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then who shall those things be? You're a fool. You prepared for everything except eternity. Now most of you don't know this. Mike knows it and some others know it. I preached the funeral for a live man. He wanted his funeral preached while he was alive. And I said, well, Dan got it arranged. I'm, st I'm trying to stay away from that man. He nearly got me shot. Way around. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, uh, I said, well, Paul, if you'll let me preach the sermon I want to preach and you'll take this seriously, then not as a joke, I'll do it. I want to preach about the great mistake of Paul C. Blevins. How you prepared for everything except eternity. And as I preached that sermon that day, I watched people in the audience cry. And Crandall was having a gospel meeting, and 20-something or 30-something came forward that night, and they said it was mainly because of the funeral sermon. They heard that day. See, we make the same mistake sometimes. We prepare for everything except eternity.
Well, I'm going to buy my burial plot so we'll know where that's going to be, and I'm going to get me an insurance policy that will cover me so the family won't be taxed when I die, and uh, I'm going to lay up some money for my mate, and I'm going to do all of this, thou fool, tonight. Thy soul shall be required of thee. See, we make the same mistakes. We don't realize it sometimes. See how valuable the parables are for us to learn these great truths. Now, I may call somebody a fool. You may call somebody a fool. And you may miss it completely. I may miss it completely. What if God calls somebody a fool? That's what he is. He doesn't miss it. Thou fool, tonight, Thy soul shall be required of thee. Oh, he believed he was going to die, but not today. You believe you're going to die, but not today. This is not your day. We never know when our day is going to come. When I was on the operating table having my pacemaker put in, the doctor told Kay I flatlined. Well, I'd been doing it for some time, so I pulled out of it. So you don't always pull out of it. You know, sometimes we're fortunate. God says, the fool has said in his heart, there is no God. In Matthew 7, 26, And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And then this deals with the kingdom. People in the kingdom. This is you, me. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins, which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five were wise and five were foolish. Five stayed prepared. Five didn't. It's important. You and I stay prepared. In Proverbs 3.35 the wise shall inherit glory. Man, that's wonderful. But shame shall be the promotion of fools. Fools are going to be promoted. They're just not going to like their promotion. They're going to be promoted to a devil's hell. Now, before I go on, anybody uh, got any questions or comments right fast? Because they're fixing to ring that bell on me. Now, look at the major point number nine. Luke 12, 21. So is he that layeth up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. Listen. You've got to be rich toward God to go to heaven. You don't have to be rich in material goods. The rich men in Lazarus in Luke 16, 19 and following. In this life, which one had you rather been? Oh, you'd rather be the rich man. Me too. But boy, when they died, the picture changed. Even though poor old Lazarus didn't have anything, he is rich toward God. And that's what you've got to be. That's what i got to be. And the rich man was very poor toward God. Hurriedly, let's look at some of the lessons on page 85. Possessions are a trust from God. And you and I have got to realize that. He's put them in your care and mine. Number two, man's greatest possession is his soul. Why shall it profit a man if he should gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Riches can steal our affections. And I want to read this. We'll get into this. I think it's next week. The parable of the sower. And that which fell among thorns are they which when they have heard go forth and are choked with the cares, the riches, the pleasures of this life and bring no fruit to perfection. See, we can allow the things of this life to choke Christianity right out of us. Then number four, things are necessary for living, but they do not make a life. Karen Lynn Travis lived in a trailer that should have been condemned. You could go into it 
and smell the fumes from the furnace. I, I knew they were going to die in that trailer. And I bought them a carbon monoxide detector. Elvin and I did. Cause, and also a smoke detector. Trying to save their lives. Well, they had it pulled out when they bought them a new double wide. And as she saw it leaving the property, she cried. She kept that thing clean as a pen. It was a pile of junk. And you know why she cried? Because of the happy memories there. We taught our girls, never depend on material things to make you happy. And she lived by that. And we got to live by that. Don't count on material things to make you happy. Then one may be wise in physical things and a fool in spiritual things. We found that out here. Number six, we must be rich toward God. Number seven, we should look for opportunities to do good. Number eight, eternal investments are better than earthly ones. You and I may have some good uh, retirement plans, but the best one is with God. We must realize that life is uncertain. Oh, he had all this laid up. And lo and behold, thou fool, tonight thy soul is required of thee. Then who shall those things be? Then the soul of man cannot be satisfied with material things. And we got to understand that. Look at these movie stars that commit suicide and they're millionaires. And all these other people that commit suicide. Our security must be in God and not in material things. Remember how much Howard Hughes left behind? Do you remember how much it was? All of it. Billions. He is so rich, they still don't know how much he left behind. And he didn't leave a will, and they still don't know who it goes to. One will never see a U-Haul fall in a hearse. You don't get to take it with you. Then in Isaiah 55, 1 and 2, Hold, everyone that thirsteth, come ye to the waters, and ye that have no money, come ye buy and eat. Yea, come buy wine, milk, without money and without price. The point here is, salvation is free. Come and get it. That's what those verses represent. Thank you for your attention.